I had a dream to become a Disney animator. This is before Pixar, before DreamWorks. It was very competitive. We all know that life is difficult. That was the greatest moment because I knew in that moment that someday I would get into Disney because I would outwork. Welcome to the Spencer Lodge podcast in partnership with Vault Hill, Arabian Business and Najahi Events. Today's guest, he wanted to be a Disney animator more than anything else. And his dream came true and he's worked on some amazing movies. Let me just give you some idea here. Pocahontas, Mulan, Tarzan, Madagascar, A Little Wild, all of these, Salt Blinkoff has been behind. He's on the show today to talk to us about how he got into animation at Disney, how difficult it was, and how you can achieve anything you set your mind to if you really know what to do and you take the action that's required. Cue the music, because this is one heck of an interview, and I promise you are going to love it. Vault Hill is the world's first human-centric metaverse that's opened its doors for brands and entities to launch their presence in the metaverse in only 48 hours. This is the fastest activation ever and the first time ever any metaverse has offered this. Upon this activation process, brands will receive free virtual land in Vault Hill City and can give life to their metaverse presence by buying buildings in the Vault Hill marketplace and deploy it on their dedicated V land. Then brands can customize their land using unbounded creativity, they can display their own NFTs or upload different media, logos or digital creations to start to capitalize from their digital assets. Go check out vaulthill.io. And lastly, thank you to Najahi Events, who have been sponsoring us now on the podcast for over a year. Najahi bring motivational speakers to the region to help inspire, educate and motivate you to achieve better success and live a better life. So thank you so much for coming to join us today. Thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure. We've been spending our time in LA this week, making this podcast, meeting some fantastic people. But there's something about you that our man over there, okay, <laughs> has been banging on about this week, saying yeah. that you're an incredible storyteller. Wow. Is that, is that, is that fair? Um, I'll tell you, uh, I love storytelling uh -huh. because I've always found for myself that stories have a way of impacting us in our lives. You know, think about the Bible, right? All those stories, number one bestseller, right? Ever. Uh, ever, right? <laughs> if you don't have one, go get yourself one. <laughs> but um, yeah, stories are a way to deliver a message. And I'll just give you an example. As a filmmaker, if I get a, a movie theater, and I fill a theater and I get in front of an audience and I go, hey guys, I got a theme, I got a message for you. You know, um, Lion King, right? Leadership is taking responsibility. And if I say that to them, they'd be like, okay, eh, I hear you, but it's, it doesn't mean anything. So as a filmmaker, we say to our audiences, you know what, shut off your phones, watch this glowing rectangle for the next two hours and you will not learn a message or a theme, you will experience it. That's the power of storytelling, right? We get to, you know, Star Wars. I felt like I was Luke Skywalker, Karate Kid, when he does the big kick against the bully, right? We felt like that was us. So stories always have a very powerful way of conveying a message and a theme. And I've always found uh, that I just want to be part of it. Do you find when you think about storytelling, you take those two examples then, you know, Karate Kid has... It has the hero, it has the sage, Mr. Miyagi. That's it right. has um, the Cobra Kai, whatever it's called, is your is the evil. Right. Um, in Star Wars, obviously, we've got Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, Yoda right. as our sage. Mentorship, right, same structure. Yeah. Yeah, all movies, all stories really do follow a very similar structure. You have a main character, a protagonist, who is flawed. And every one of these characters has something about them that they need to work on. And then something is something they have to learn and then something that makes them unique, something that makes them special. Like Karate Kid, for example, Daniel, in the beginning of the movie, the very first time you meet him, he's walking into this new apartment he's going to live in. And there's a little old person. I think it's an old lady who has a cat. He comes right down and puts a little bowl of milk or water for the cat. You know that this guy, his moral compass is pointed the right way, but he's got to learn something that when things get difficult, you can't give up. There's actually a scene where the bullies bully him and he says to his mom, can't we just go home? Can't we just go home? This is a guy that his moral compass is pointed the right way, but when times get difficult, 
I'm out. And at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, right? <laughs> he has to learn, like, even if it gets difficult, you don't give up. That's how you'll find balance. There's that message again. Do you think as we get older, we, we identify less as the hero and more as the sage? Um, hopefully we will, as we get older, look for those opportunities to mentor other people, younger people. Uh, but at the same time, we always have a journey to continue to grow and learn, right? I think what we can pull from those movies, though, is no matter what our age, we should all have mentorship, all have teachers. I mean, I remember my own life, definitely a handful of teachers that said certain things to me at the right time that changed the trajectory of the rest of my life. You know, so often in life, we're, we're in the maze and we don't see that perspective that age or wisdom can lend us. And, uh, you know, teachers and mentors really are, are powerful. You know. It's interesting you say that. It just took me, took me back to some parts in my life, and it wasn't necessarily teachers, but in my early career, I, I was selling office equipment. Uh -huh. So photocopying machines. This was back in the 80s. Yeah. And I was, the olden days, as my kids call it. The in the olden days, yeah, my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I... I, I, I was I was young, but I was earning really good money. But I was spending more money than I was earning. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what was it the catch? And so I sat down with this guy, and, and this is the God's honest truth. His name was Seamus Murphy, Whoa. so very Irish, yeah. Right. And he was successful in the business. An older guy, a wiser guy, a sage type character. Yeah. And I just said to him one day, I sat at the desk with one of our, you know, the vending machine plastic cups with the dodgy cups of tea and right. coffee in, you know, hot chocolates. We sat. Look how clear I remember that. <laughs> and I said, Seamus, you know, I'm earning good money, but how do you, how do you earn really good money? How do how do people earn mega money? What do they do? And he said to me, the only way you'll ever earn big money is if you work with money. Mm. And as he said it, it just sat there in my brain for a little while. I was like, oh, what does he mean by that? And he didn't give me any more. Mm. He just left me there. And I went off about my day. Six months later, I'm working in the wealth management industry in a completely different field to what I'd been in. And I was hell-bent on making sure that I worked with money. Uh. And so the, there are those moments in your life where, where it changes direction because as some... Well, somebody said something or someone's pointed out something to you that maybe you couldn't find yourself. Oh, yeah. You know, first of all, you just said that. And I love that he gave you that advice but didn't explain it. It reminds me, you remember the movie City Slickers with yeah. Billy Crystal? When Jack Palance, the old cowboy, says the secret of life is one thing. And Billy Crystal's character goes, yeah, but what's the one thing? And Palance says, that's what you have to figure out. And it's like, oh, what is it, you know? <laughs> But, you know, I, I can tell you specifically for me, you know, I had a journey where I had a dream to become a Disney animator. This is before Pixar, before DreamWorks. It was very competitive. And at one point in my journey, when I was in art school, I had gotten rejected from Disney uh, the second time. It was very competitive. They picked, I think, about 15 students a year out of 4,000 portfolios, the best of the best. And uh, I was going to give up on that dream. And I went to one of my professors in desperation. And I said to him, let me ask you, like, what else can I do? Like, what am I doing wrong? And he stopped me and he said, let me ask you a question, Saul. Can you control whether Disney says yes or no? And I'm like, no. He says, can you control how good any of the competition is? How, how good any of the other artists are? And I said, no. He says, so what is it that you can control? And I thought about it. I said, well, I can control how good I am as an artist. He goes, no, you can't. You think Michael Jordan could control that he become the best basketball player that ever lived? He said to me, Michael Jordan controlled one thing. He took 750 jump shots every single day before breakfast. My professor looked at me and said, the only thing that you can control in your life is how hard you work. The outcome is not up to us, but the effort that we make, that's the only thing we can control. And then he told me to take out a piece of paper and a pen. He told me to write down a sentence and I wrote it down. The sentence was, nobody worked harder today than me. He told me to write it down. I wrote it down. Nobody worked harder today than me. He says, if you can't say those words and they're true, you don't go to bed. So I took that and put it up over my desk. Wow. Nobody worked harder today than me. And on those nights when I knew that I worked hard, but maybe I could have gone a little bit more, that motivated me to keep going. Incredible Gary professor. Gary Vaynerchuk says to people, he says, you, you will never outwork me. 
that's why I will win. <laughs> and people say, yeah, yeah, you know, but there's other people out there that can work harder than you, is that? Right. Nobody will ever outwork me. He right. said, I might not be gifted, I might not be talented. Yeah. He said, but you will not outwork me. Right. He said, that's it. And then Will Smith also says, get on the treadmill. Right. I would rather die than lose to you. Yeah? <laughs> so if we get on it together and we're going to run, I, w- I, I will die before I give up to you. That's right. And it's that... What you're saying is exactly that thing. Well, that competition motivates us. I mean, I remember when I was in art school, the first week, a Disney representative came from Disney to our school. He stands up on the stage. There's like 800 students, every freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. And he looks out to the audience and he says to us, before I tell you what it takes to get into Disney, let me just ask you, how many of you have the dream to become a Disney animator? Every hand went up. He said, well, just so you know, out of the 800 students that are here, maybe, just maybe four of you will ever work there. That's how competitive it is. And I remember when he said that, I thought one thing, I wonder who the other three are going to be. No. Right? Because like in life, we either believe in ourselves that we can accomplish or we don't. And I don't mean what we tell people on Facebook or Instagram or what we portray. I mean, deep down, when I'm alone, do I really believe that I can accomplish. And I actually remember one quick story based on what you were saying that Gary Vee said. You know, Disney said in order to get into Disney, you have to draw humans and animals from life. No cartoon characters. So I would go to the zoo. And one day we went to the zoo, me and my friend Andy with like a couple other students. It was about 12 students. It was for a class. And we get to the zoo and it was Columbus, Ohio. It was like London weather. You will relate. It was freezing cold, bitter cold. We get to the zoo. The second we get there, we go into a cafe. It was a Wendy's cafe. And I get a hot drink, and we're getting hot drinks. And we sharpen the pencils. And me and Andy, my best friend, we go out, and we're trying to find an animal to draw. And we find an elephant who's literally just walking back and forth. And when you're studying animation and movement, to have an animal repeat a movement over and over again is like the greatest gift you can give an artist. So I stood there, freezing, drawing this elephant, walking back and forth. Andy was too. Afterwards, 40 minutes later, we get on the bus and I'm showing Andy what I drew and he showed me what he drew. And I said to one of the other guys, hey, we never saw you at the elephants. What animals were you drawing? The guy looks at me and says, well, none of us ever left the Wendy's cafe. I said, what do you mean you didn't leave? He goes, well, we couldn't leave. I said, why couldn't you leave? He goes, because it was too cold. That was the greatest moment because I knew in that moment that someday I would get into Disney because I would outwork all those people because when we go through struggle, when we go through pain in life, we shouldn't have the mindset that we have to go through the pain. We get to grow through the pain. If you watch a documentary about anybody that inspires you, Gary Vee, Steve Jobs, whoever, Michael Jordan, like whoever inspires you, you watch a documentary about someone that's achieved some level of greatness, believe me, The thing they all have in common is they struggled and they persevered. They don't just go through pain. They have the mindset that there will be pain. And when we are knowing that there will be pain, it motivates us to accomplish. Right? Mm -hmm. Those guys that climb Everest, they don't think it's going to be easy. They're not surprised by the death zone when they get there, right? The top of Everest. I always tell my kids, if there's ever a vacation opportunity and there's a place called the death zone... Maybe you don't want to go, you know, (laughs) but those people that do that, they know before they even set out, it's going to be the hardest hell that I'm ever going to go through. Mm. By the way, same thing for being a parent, right? You're you're a parent. I'm a parent. If you think raising kids is easy before you begin, don't do it. But if you know it's going to be difficult and it's going to take work, and as my wife always says, it's the greatest kind of work. It motivates you to accomplish, Mm. Mm. right? That's the mindset. Absolutely. I completely agree with everything you just said. Take take me on this journey then, because most people wouldn't have had to struggle to get a job in the company they want to work for as much as you. I'll give you one quick example. My daughter Taylor left university in the summer. She studied um, graphic design and art Mm. at the University of Arts in London. So she went to a good school and she came out. I'm like, what do you want to be? She said, I want to work in experiential events. And I'm like, okay. Because I want, I want to design that kind of stuff. That's what, that's what I'm interested in. I'm like, okay, I said, who are the companies that do that? Right. And so she said, well, I know three or four. I said, right, you need a list of every company that does that. Right. Okay, so that's the first thing. Get that list together. So she right. gets the list together. Um, she goes off on holiday for two weeks. She comes back. And I'm like, right, you're going to start applying for jobs. I said, so this is what I'll do. This is my deal I'll do for you. 
offer to go and work for the CEO of any of those companies for free for the next 12 months. Mm. Okay. And just say, I just want to learn. You can pay me an education. I'll support you. Go and do that. Right. And she's wow. like, what? So, so I'll, I'll have money to be able to, yeah, I said, you'll have money to be able to buy your food and all that kind of stuff, but go and do that. And she, she was pleased that I said that, but she didn't do that. Mm. Okay. She sat on it and she applied for the jobs that were advertised on five companies and got an interview with them. Interesting. And didn't get any of them. And then was disappointed. And I was like, right, how are you feeling? She's like, I feel shit. <laughs> right. uh, good. I'm glad you are. I needed you to get to a point because it's not easy. So now what you're going to do is you're going to apply for 30 jobs a day for the next month. She's like, what? I said, you're going to apply for 30 jobs a day every day for the next month. Right. I said, and 30 is the minimum you're going to apply for every day. And at the end of every day, I want a text message. Okay, with the 30 companies you've applied to. Okay, and if you've got any interviews booked, that's what I want to know. She did that for four weeks. By the end of the fourth week, she landed her dream job. Wow. Okay, she started there two weeks ago. Wow. Okay, in the company she wants to work for, the salary's not great. Okay, I'm not, it doesn't matter about the salary. Okay, don't worry about that. But she's on her ladder. She's in the she company knows, right. she wants to work for. Okay, and, she, and she's, right. she's nailed it. And I'm like, what did you learn from that? She said, Dad, I realized that I had to go out there and hustle like crazy all day, every day. My, my daughter had never heard of a recruitment consultancy. Right. <laughs> you know, companies that some people put that you, you and I know about. It's a different generation. She's like, <clears throat> what do they do? Yeah. I'm like, well, you go to them and they help you find jobs. She's like, do they? <laughs> so, no idea. No idea. Right. She didn't know who to write to at a company to apply for a job. Right. She didn't realize that just sending your CV off Right. Okay. To inquiries at xyz.com. Right. Okay. Wasn't going to be the solution. Right. And so that hustle. It's going to take a little more. Yeah. And that hustle and that hard work has taught her that, ah, so if I put the effort in, right. okay, things will fall in my well, First lap. of all, she's very lucky that you're her dad. Okay. Because you know what? There are people out there that may have a goal, but they don't know how to accomplish it. They don't have those tools. Um, you actually remind me of my mom. My mom, you know, I had this dream to become a Disney animator. I had yeah. seen The Little Mermaid, right? Like, that's BF, before Frozen, okay? <laughs> so I see this movie, and I'm like, I want to be a Disney animator. That was my goal. I just didn't know how to do it. Today, you want to be a Disney animator. You go to a little thing called Google, and you type in, how do you become a Disney animator? And you'll get the answer. Yeah. But back then, in the olden days, no internet. That's right. Everyone watching at home, no such thing as YouTube, <laughs> no Wi-Fi, and we still made it, Okay. So I go to, how do I figure this out, right? There was no phone number. How do you find Disney animation? So my mom took me from New York, not my older brother, not my twin sister, took me to Disney World on a trip, walking me around Disney just to find out how her son could become a Disney animator. It was actually a little embarrassing. I remember we're getting on the, um, it's a small world boat ride. Oh yeah. Like we're getting on the boat and the lady at Disney, the cast members like, how many in your party were like two? My mom was like, by the way, my son wants to be a Disney animator. Can you help him? It was very embarrassing. <laughs> So we get on the boat, and the woman says, look, it's a boat ride. We don't hire animators here. Uh, but if you want your son to work at Disney, he's got to go to the Disney casting building. It was two minutes away from where we were in Disney World. So my mom drove me to this Disney office building, which was imaginative and beautiful. I remember the doorknobs were made of brass, and it looked like the ones from Alice in Wonderland uh -huh. that speak. I open up these doors. I walk into this atrium. Gold statuettes of Mickey, Donald, Pluto, Goofy. Even the air in there was like, like Disney air, like pixie dust in the air. And I remember walking in this room in this atrium and, and there was this giant ramp that went up and painted on the ceiling was Peter Pan and Wendy flying off to Neverland. And I'm like, that's where I want to go, Neverland. So I finally get called for the interview and the woman is sitting there and she says, can I help? I'm like, yeah, my dream is to become a Disney animator. She goes, well, we don't hire those here. I'm like, well, who do you hire? She goes, well, we hire people that work the rides, you know, people that make the teacups spin or people that make the Dumbo ride go up and down. And I'm like, that's not really my dream. She goes, well, hold on a second. She walks out, comes back in two minutes later and hands me a piece of paper. That piece of paper became the most valuable piece of paper I ever held in my hands, other than my wedding contract. You tell my wife I said that. If you're watching, honey, I know. <laughs> that piece of paper was a list of eight schools eight art universities that Disney recruits their artists. She said to me, if you want to be a Disney animator, you need to go to one of these schools. Boom, that was it. 
that was the equation. Like to me, it was an equation. Saul plus go to one of these schools will equal dream. So often I meet students or anybody and I ask them, what's your goal? And people who are lucky enough to have the clarity of what their goal is, then I'll ask them, how will you accomplish it? And sometimes I get a blank look. You know, you go to a great restaurant, you taste an unbelievable dessert, tiramisu, cream br creme brulee, whatever you like. You want to make it at home? Well, you can do it if you have the recipe. Mm -hmm. That's what that was. That piece of paper was the recipe. Now I know how to get my dream. I think the tool that all of us need to remember is it's one thing to have clarity on what I want to accomplish. And not just what do I want to do with my life, but who do I want to become along the way? Because ultimately, that's the legacy we leave our children. That's the legacy we leave our world. You know, someday my kids are going to know that their dad worked on a lot of Disney movies. Okay, that's cool. But what kind of father was he? Mm -hmm. What kind of a human being was he? Mm -hmm. The legacy we leave the world is who did I become along the way? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to have the clarity of what I want to accomplish, but then I got to find out how. You know, I, I met a student once, an artist. You're, you're going to like this. This is kind of a Spencer thing to do, okay? <laughs> okay this, so. this is kind of like the kind of advice I think that you would give for making it real, right? For making it happen. Um, there was a student, an artist, she was uh, in high school, right? Secondary school, is that what you call it? Yeah. In England, right? Secondary She's in secondary school and she shows me her art portfolio and all of her friends were around. I was actually in, uh, in London, I was at Bristol or Leeds. That was one of those unis. I was speaking there, okay. traveling, speaking. And she shows me her portfolio and all her friends come around. She opens it up and all her friends start going, oh my gosh, that's so good. How do you do that? They're like freaking out, excited for her. And you see, she's taking pride in her work. And uh, she says to me, do you have any advice? And I said, but before I give you the advice, let me ask you a question. What's your goal? Like, what is your goal? I'm not going to tell you what your goal mm -hmm. should be. Why don't you tell me what your goal should be? Well, I want to make it as an artist. I go, okay, well, what's your goal in speaking to me then? She says, well, I want advice on how I can become a better artist. I'm like, okay, great. Here's what you got to do. She shows me the very first drawing, and it's a drawing that took her like 15 hours to draw. It was a sneaker. And she even said to me, my parents love this one. This is my mom's favorite. And I said, okay, here's my advice to you. For the rest of your life, whenever your parents tell you they like artwork that you did, or your friends sitting around here, and I pointed to her friends, they tell you that they like your artwork, the first thing I want you to say to them is, thank you. And in your mind, I want you to think to yourself, they know nothing about art. And then I want you to go find the professor at your university and sit by their car and tell them, I'm not leaving here until you tell me three things I need to improve on. Because at the end of the day, the only way to get better at anything is to find out where your flaws are, mm -hmm. to find out where your weakness is. One of my art teachers when I was in high school knew that I was terrible at drawing hands. Because she would see all the drawings I would do. She goes, why are there no hands on any of the characters? Are, are, are there no hands on the people that live in New York where, you, where I was growing up? I'm like, no, they had hands. She goes, well, why don't you draw them? I go, well, because it's difficult. She goes, okay, good. For the next six months, every night before you go to bed, I want you to draw hands from a different position. And you know what will happen in six months? You'll get good at drawing hands. Yeah. And she taught me one of the greatest lessons. In life, we need to first get the clarity of what our weakness is. Then go all in to turn that weakness into our strength. Mm. That's the way, that's the answer key to growing. That goes for everything in life. By the way, my wife can tell me where I screw up in life, not just at business, but like as a human being. Like she could be like, you know, I heard you on a podcast last week and, and you came off a little arrogant. You need to humble yourself a lot. I'd be like, thank you, honey. Now I know what I have to work on. And hopefully we have someone in our life that can tell us where those flaws are, where those cracks in our vessel are. Because ultimately, I, I really think, Spencer, that that's, that's the real work of life, you know? Let, let's talk about what success means. Mm. So when you, when you think about success it, in the very American dream kind of way, it always reverts to some form of measurement in financial terms. Yeah. Because that financial <clears throat> gain then has created the lovely house and the cars and all the yada, yada, yada that goes with it. As we get older, we realize that the financial success probably wasn't the biggest motivator of all in, in, in the long run, because right. a lot of things don't matter. Right. But how do you measure success or how do you ask about success? Yeah. First of all, I love that you're bringing this up 
because there's such an onslaught right now. If you listen to podcasts of many successful people, a lot of people have books out and there's those buzz buzzwords that you hear people talk about. They talk about words like abundance, mm -hmm. right? You hear that a lot now. Yeah, abundance. Yeah. yeah, that's a big turnoff for me. Okay. I hope I don't offend anyone watching. Abundance means more, <laughs> right? It means more. You, yeah. If you listen to this podcast, if you buy my book, you will have more and more of what? Whatever it is you want. It sounds like we're children. My eight-year-old wants more. Life is not about how do I get more. I'll quote one of the great sages from your country, Winston Churchill, who has the greatest quotes of anyone alive, who ever lived. He said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. The way that I define success is really simply is waking up with a perspective that I want to impact humanity. It's not that I want to get more. It's, I want to give more. You know, talking about Disney, Lion King, like we were speaking about before, Lion King is an incredible movie. Biggest animated movie of all time before Frozen, by the way. And that movie had such a powerful message. Simba, you remember, mm. he's young, he sings about it. I just can't wait to be king. He thinks being a king is he can get his way. His father even says, Mufasa says, Simba, there's more to being a king than getting your way all the time. Simba's like, there's more? Like, what could be better? And then something happens to dad. You remember what happens to dad? Spoiler alert. Yeah. He, he dies. It <laughs> is a Disney movie. They have to kill off a parent like every Disney movie, right? Finding Nemo, they killed off the mom, right? But it's amazing how many Disney movies there are no moms. You ever notice that Little Mermaid has no mom, right? Aladdin has no mom. Belle has no mom, right? Yeah. Bambi, look what they did to his mom, right? Yeah. Right. You got a thing with moms. You got to figure that out. So Lion King, right? He thinks being a king is I can do whatever I want. Dad dies. Simba goes off and moves to Hakuna Matata mm -hmm. world. Remember with Pumbaa and Timon? Mm -hmm. Hakuna Matata, what a what, right? Mm -hmm. He goes and lives there. It's a lush garden of Eden. It's an oasis. Waterfalls and plants. It's beautiful. He's got everything. He sleeps in a hammock. He's in a jacuzzi. No responsibilities. No worries. Towards the end of the movie, somebody shows up to see him. You remember who shows up? This is your Disney trivia, Spencer, no. you know? Nala. Nala, that's Remember right, the yeah. little lioness, right? Yeah. But she's all grown up now. Yeah. Right? She's grown up, and she's singing their song, like, can you feel the love tonight? And they're rolling around. The sun is setting. They're about to kiss. It's actually a really strange scene. They're about to kiss. I always cover my kids' eyes for that. They're like, <laughs> but two, Dad, it's lions. lions I'm like, still inappropriate. Still inappropriate. <laughs> so like they're about to kiss, they're rolling around. And then finally she says to him, Simba, it's good to see you, but you got to come back with me. He's like, no, no, look where I live. Right? I live in La La Land. Look where I live. It's amazing. She's like, no, no, you don't understand. Scar's taking over everything. And if you don't come back with me, everyone's going to die. And you are responsible. Then you know what he says? Hakuna Matata. I'm staying right here. She goes, I can't believe you. When are you going to grow up? When are you going to? He goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're starting to sound like my dad. She says, at least one of us does. And you know what she does? She leaves him. She leaves him. She actually sang about it. She goes, why won't he be the king I know he is, the king I see inside? When are you going to realize what greatness really is? When are you going to be a king? When are you going to take responsibility? She leaves him. He's left alone. Rafiki shows up, hits him on the head. He sees Mufasa in the clouds. His father, remember who you are. Remember? Mm -hmm. And Simba goes back, defeats Scar, and Lion King becomes the biggest animated movie of all time. BF, before Frozen. Not because we love movies about lions, but because that movie showed us a taste of what true greatness is. You know what success is? Waking up with the mindset that I want to take responsibility for the world. That's what greatness is. You know, you know I have a podcast, right? Mm-hmm. I interviewed an exceptional person. Yeah, you never interviewed me, I know. Yeah. Well, we're just getting going. No, so. too, late now. <laughs> too late now. I asked you first. So, <laughs> so, you know, Spencer, you and I talked before the record, and I was asking you about your podcast and all your adventures, and you told me there was one episode that changed you, right? Well, that, that's a similar story that happened to me. Yeah. I had a guest on, and I thought I knew how it was going to go, and the rug was pulled out from below me, and literally it changed everything in my life afterwards. It was George Foreman. The boxer. Okay. Right. Now, a lot of people don't know him as a boxer, right? If you're like under the age of 40, you think he's the grill guy, the yeah. Foreman grill. But for those people that don't know, George Foreman, he was an Olympic gold medal boxer. Mm -hmm. 
He was a heavyweight champion of the world, which is many people will say the hardest accolade you can ever win in sports because boxing is painful. Mm -hmm. There's no teammates. It's just you. You're the only one to blame, right? And it's a mindset. It's a mental game. Heavyweight champion of the world twice with a 20-year gap. He comes out of retirement 20 years later, does it again, and becomes the oldest to ever do that. Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. the, the foreman grill. He made $128 million the first year on the grill. So I go through this interview with him. And I say in the very intro, I go, George, you've done this and you've done that. You're a father, a grandfather, great-grandfather. What's And he goes, Saul, out of the whole of things you said on that list, you know what I'm most proud of? Great-grandfather. Imagine bringing on Michael Jordan, Steve Jobs if he was alive, and you go through all their accolades, and the first thing out of their mouth is, let me tell you, did I invent the iPhone? Yeah. Did I create Facebook? Yeah. Do I have six rings on my finger from winning NBA champions? Yeah. But you know what matters to me most? The legacy I leave my children. Yeah. Like that was amazing. But then at the end of the interview, I go, George, what legacy do you want to leave your children? What legacy do you want to leave the world? He says one thing without missing a beat. You know what I want the world to remember about me? I loved humanity. I knew that when I walked down the street and I could smile at someone and I could impact their day, that's the legacy I wanted to leave the world. So I was blown away by that. After the episode, that night, I go and I find video footage of one of his first fights, the first night he becomes heavyweight champion of the world. And I discovered something, Spencer, that was unbelievable. The first night he becomes heavyweight champion of the world, he's 20 years old. He went in a moment from poverty to a millionaire Think of that end scene in Rocky, mm -hmm. right? He becomes heavyweight champion. Everyone crowds the mm -hmm. ring. He's calling out, yo, Adrian, I did it, right? Remember that scene? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The emotions. So George Foreman beats Smoking Joe Frazier yeah. in one night. Goes from poverty, and he had a very hard life growing up, to a millionaire. Beating his idol, Smoking Joe Frazier. And in that moment when everyone's crowding around him, a sportscaster comes up to him and takes a microphone and puts it in his face and says, George, you've just become heavyweight champion of the world. What's next for you? And Foreman says, what's next for me? I want to tell everybody the message. I want to tell those kids out there that if you're struggling in life, you can accomplish. That if I could achieve this, you could achieve anything. Beautiful answer. The first mm -hmm. thing out of his mouth, mm -hmm. the first thought he had is, I want to impact another person. And the sportscaster with the microphone says, George, no, 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 I didn't mean that. I mean in the ring. What's next for you in the ring? And Foreman answers, the world is my ring. The world is my ring. And I'm going to deliver that message every day I'm alive. Mm -hmm. You know what George Foreman teaches us at 20 years old? You know the clarity that he knew? You know what success is? It's not boxing rings. It's not money. It's not foreman grills. It's how do I take whatever position I have in life, how do I use it to impact another human being? Mm -hmm. That's what defines a life of awesome. That's what de defines a life of success. You find that two things that came to my mind there. First of all, when Lewis Hamilton won the world championship, he was in his car and he said to every kid out there, okay, I want Boom. you to know, okay, right. that if I can do it, you can do it. Don't give up on your dreams. So right. there's a similar message there. But a lot of people say to me, um, uh, I'll speak in an event and people I'll, I'll say, what are you trying to choose, to deliver here? What are you trying to impact? You trying to have, what are you tr trying to do? You know, what's this business all about? And they say, I just want to help people. And I don't believe them. Mm -hmm. right. I don't believe anything that comes out of their mouth because it feels so insincere. Right. Um, I, and I'm like, so you want to make money and then help people, or you want to make money helping people, or you want to sell your stuff so that- Anyone it, it that helps. says to you, I just want to help people, the reason it sounds insincere is because the phrase shouldn't be, I just want to. The phrase should be, I am helping people. Uh -huh. Let me just tell you, the day I started at Disney, the first day I was at Disney, as an animator, working on Pocahontas, I was a young punk kid. There were many animators that were there 20 years over me, making the millions of dollars. I was just starting out, nothing. And that first week, I remember finding students who were struggling to get into Disney. I used to sit in the lobby at Disney Animation looking at portfolios. I was 22 years old. I wasn't in a place to really give advice on portfolios. There were people that were much better than me. And I still remember one of these old animators walking out one day, and he's looking at me and giving me this look, like, who do you think you are helping a young kid? If you know a day's worth of wisdom you should be obligated to teach a day's worth of wisdom. You don't need to have money to be able to help another person. 
any, I, anything I, in life, any yeah. moment in life, anywhere we are in life, that should be our goal. I, I got into the financial services industry when I was 23. Yeah. And I wasn't allowed to have a job. I was, I went to the recruiter and she wouldn't give me a job. I remember mm. her name, Bryony. She said, you're too young. You're 23. You've got to be 25. I went home to my mum that night and I said, mum, look, they won't give me a job because I'm 23. And she's like, well, what are you going to do about it? And she just looked at me. Wow. And I was like, oh, well, I'm 23. I've got to be 25. And she said, and what are you going to do about it? Oh, I love her. And I'm like, well, I don't know. She said, well, what could you do about it? I said, I don't know. She said, are you going to let, and but my mum had a recruitment consultancy at the time. Right. And she said, are you going to let the recruiter tell you and define what you can and can't do? And I was like, right. Right. She said, she <laughs> said, what's the name of the boss of the company? I was like, his name's Mr. Mudd, Kevin Mudd. She said, go find him. And so the next day I drove back to the office, not to the recruiter, to the office. And I sat in the reception of the CEO of the company for four hours. Mm. And eventually he came by and he's like, what do you want? I said, your recruiter won't give me a job and because I'm 23 and I want a job. He said, well, you can't have a job, you're 23. And uh, I'm like, but I can do this. I, I can do, I can do this. And so he sat down and started talking to me. And as we were chatting away, he told me about his father just suffered a stroke and was in hospital and he couldn't, he couldn't wait long. And I was like, where's he in hospital? And he said, oh, he's in this place, Chelmsford Hospital. And I was like, your, your dad? He said, yeah. I said, my grandfather's in the same hospital. He's just had a stroke too. Whoa. And he drove me to the hospital so I could see my granddad and he could see his dad. Oh. And in the car on the way there, he said, in two weeks' time, you need to be in Hong Kong. I'll give you the shot. Wow. And, I, and obviously that was a, 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 <laughs> you know, a, 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 you know, whether it's the coincidence of the, the, the father and the grandfather both being in the same hospital, whether it was him taking a chance on me, yeah. <clears throat> I don't, it doesn't matter. But I knew in that moment, I knew in that moment I was not going to let him down. Yeah. Okay, no matter what, I was not going to let him down. Yeah. And I went on to be a financial advisor, but... I became obsessed with stopping people messing up their financial futures. Wow. And it leans into what you were saying, because for me, I needed, I needed to stop people when they get in, got to 65 years old, not having any money. Because I believe that if you live to the age of 90, you had 25 years and imagine living for 25 years broke right. or without, and that must be horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. So I positioned myself subconsciously as the fifth emergency service. But you cared. Oh, absolutely. And so I saw the police, I saw the firemen, I saw the ambulance, I saw the automobile association, and then I saw me. And I had a job to do. I was on a mission right. to solve this problem. Beautiful. And being on that mission to solve that problem gave me such purpose. Yeah. It, it wasn't about money. It wasn't, it was about how do I stop everyone, mate? Why are people being so stupid? It right. was like, why would you do that? Right. You know, and all day, every day. Bear in mind, I'm 23 years old. Right. I'm talking to 49 year old men, right. CEOs or whatever it is of companies earning great incomes. And there's me, right. 23. What, what experience in life do I have? Wow. None. Right. Okay. But they, these people could see the passion I had and the belief that I had to make sure that they got it right. So when I look at people and, and, and I look at uh, people that say, I want to impact stuff. I'm like, show me. Yeah. Show me what you want to do. Right. You know, we've just made a documentary on human trafficking. We spent two years making this documentary wow. because I was impacted by a woman. Mm. And this woman moved me so much that I knew I had to find a way to support her. Yeah. She was born in Portugal, two years old. Her mum left to go to the city to find work. Her mum never came back. The refugee neighbor looked after her mm. when the refugee was nine years old she died so this girl was nine years old without a mum or a dad and she was brought up by the siblings yeah she got a job as a cleaner when she was 16 she said if i'm going to be a cleaner i'm going to be the ronaldo of cleaners <laughs> she worked as a cleaner she then went to switzerland because she knew she needed to learn languages she became a cleaner in switzerland was hit by a car hit and run went to hospital and switzerland's not part of the eu so you can't work there without a permit Right. She got kicked out after coming out of hospital, went to London, got a job as a housekeeper. I'm going to be the Ronaldo of housekeepers. And then she saw this sign, Emirates cabin crew apply. She's like, cabin crew. She now speaks Portuguese, German and English. She's like, my dream is to be cabin crew. 
she gets the job. She flies to Dubai. Her first flight is to Bangladesh, to the slums. Mm. She's there for 24 hours. She walks around the slums. She's like, what the hell is going on here? She'd never seen something so bad. And she decides she's going to help one of the families. She flies back to Dubai. She sells her possessions, goes back to, uh, to Bangladesh, to wow. Dakar, and promises to help this family. Yeah. And then she's like, there's too many people here. How do, I, how do I solve this problem? And she goes on to Google, and she types in, how do I raise money for charity? The first thing that comes up is climb Everest. She's never, ever been to a gym. Oh, my gosh. She's never run 100 yards. She's never done fitness. Right, this isn't an athlete. This isn't a hiker, a mountain climber. There's like Nothing. a normal person out there. And so she, so she reads it and it says, if you raise my, if you climb Everest, Jill, da, 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 this is what you could raise. She's like, right, I've got to help these kids. She trains to climb Everest. She becomes the first Portuguese woman to ever climb Everest. And I say to Maria, you climbed the biggest mountain in the world. WTF for a minute here. <laughs> what were you thinking? Right. She said, I had to help the kids, Spence. Right. I had to help the kids. Yeah. Since then, she's gone on to go to the North Pole, the South Pole. She's climbed every mountain that exists. She's done eight Ironmans and eight weeks and eight <laughs> continents and yada, yada, yada. Wow. <laughs> Her sole focus with every one of these challenges is to help these children. Beautiful. 682 kids have come from the slums of Bangladesh into international education all over the world, all because of her. Wow. When you find people that are on a mission and have purpose, regardless of any financial benefit, they're, they're, like, they're like bees to honey. Mm. Being around people like that, that have that kind of mission and purpose, I, I can't get enough of her. It's like a drug yeah. when I'm with her. Oh, and yeah. she's a shy lady, you know, she's five foot two. Right. She's a lovely girl, but not, we're friends. But she's shy. Ah, yeah, you would right. She lives in a two bedroom apartment in Dubai and she has 12 kids living in that apartment with right. her, okay, right. with her and her husband. She's, she's just this humble, humble lady. But when I'm with her, I feel like, I feel like you've given me, given me an injection of, uh, of, <laughs> okay. of spinach, right. okay, like right. Popeye, and all of a sudden my muscles grow and my, my body just gets bigger and my, right. my force grows and I'm like, yes, yeah. okay, just when I'm around her. And then we could be just eating a bag of chips. Right. Because when you find people that have got this kind of purpose, you realize in life that if there are people that are willing to live a life of and make that much sacrifice to make that part of their world a better place, right. you know that's a decent human being. Right, and you, you talk about it's like a drug, right? I think what the drug really is when we're around people like that, is that we're actually getting a glimpse into our potential. What we could be, yeah. What we could be. Yeah. Right? You know, on New Year's Eve, there's a, a phrase that we all utter to each other. Happy New Year. Mm -hmm. it, it's you're giving someone like a blessing. Like, I have a blessing I want to give you for the year. I, I want you to have a year filled with happiness. And I always say, if you ask 99% of the world, what do you want out of life? Most people would say, I want to be happy. And most people will tell you, I will be happy if I get this, this, and this. Meaning my happiness, that state is dependent on outside experiences. I think we need to be careful to go for a life of happy because there's the reality is that what makes you happy may not be what's good for you. Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. Just because you're happy doesn't mean it's good for you. It doesn't mean it's good for the world. Mm -hmm. There's something sweeter than a life of happiness. That's a life of meaning. And meaning only comes when I have the mindset of I want to impact another person. You see, what many people find out is when they do get everything they want, financial success, the boat, the house in Malibu, whatever it is they want, once they finally get all those things, they think they're going to be content. But there's statistics out there that people are like, yeah, I still wake up and I'm not satiated. It's still not enough because those things won't ever give us what we're really craving. What we need, not what we want. What we need is I want purpose. You said the word purpose, Spence. We all want to find that niche of purpose, that niche of meaning. And at the end of the day, you'll ask people that have accomplished that feeling that you feel when you were around that woman, that you feel when you made an impact on those 49-year-old guys. That's the feeling that my life matters. That's what we're going for. I want to look at my life and know it mattered because here's the thing. You can't take any of it with you. We can't take any of it with you. Steve Jobs built a giant yacht. You should go look it up online, everybody. If you're interested in yachts, go check out what Steve Jobs, he designed, he hired Philippe Stark, 
the greatest interior hotel designer, furniture designer in the last, I don't know, 50 years to design the most beautiful yacht that Steve Jobs never got to go on. Never got to go on it. So you design this beautiful yacht. But that comes down to, you said the word, and this is a word that irks me, things. Things, right. Things. You can't take it with you. Things. Well, what, what do they do? Right. You know, people people spend money on things. And it's... Uh, do you know what? We, you, you're a couple of years younger than me. But I think we have to... We have to experience some of this to realise what it is. Right. It doesn't necessarily need to be the house in Malibu. It can be the 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 two seater sports but car. But you have to you experience know, it you, to realise it's yeah. not everything. It's not going to give you that feeling that you ultimately wanted. Yeah. It's fun, but it has a shelf life, right? It's not going to give you that feeling. Look, you know, I mean, you're a father. Talking about time, which I think is the most valuable thing we have is our time. Just think about the time that I give my kids or my wife. You know, the thing is, the, the, t the time I have with them, my son the other day, I could take him to a Laker game, I could take him to all these things, but he's like, all I want is just time with my dad. Because it's meaningful. You're building a relationship, you know? I think we work so hard on trying to getting these, as you said, these things, these physical things. But then you wake up and you're like, what was it for? You know, what was it for? Ultimately, we have to wake up with that mindset of I want to have a meaningful life because I want to impact another person. That's, and, and, you, and I love it. You said we have to experience it, right? You, you, someone could tell you that, but it's like, you know what? Let me figure it out for myself. Once you experience the meaning that you get from impacting another person, like go to a hospital ward and go just cheer up somebody, mm -hmm. cheer up someone who's alone. Forget about going to the drama, the drama of a hospital ward. Look around your circle. Anyone watching this, go to your circle and next time you're in a social gathering, maybe you're that outgoing person, or maybe that outgoing person's talking to you. Believe me, there's someone sitting at that table that no one's talking to. I say this to my kids all the time. There's someone in school that no one really talks. Go to that person and light them up. Let them see their potential. That's the drug that I'm going for, Spence. I want to have those opportunities where I can show someone their potential. Being an animator. Yeah. Obviously, as you've so eloquently described some examples of various uh, animated movies that we've we've watched and seen as part of our uh, our lives, they they tell those stories and those stories inspire and motivate different people in different right. ways. When you want to be an animator as you grow up, <clears throat> do you want to be an animator because you love the art of animation, you love the process of animation, or was it because you wanted to find a way of telling stories? So you have asked the best question, and no one's ever asked me this, by the way. Okay. That is the most amazing question. So when I started out, the, the thing that made me want to go into movies was the movie E.T. Mm -hmm. I saw the movie E.T. I was 11 years old. I remember tapping my mom at the end of the movies and like, mom, that's what I want to do someday. And she's like, what, you want to leave planet Earth in a spaceship? And I'm like, no, 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 I want to make movies. Movies, I, I just thought it was an inspiring world. I wanted to be part of it. When I saw The Little Mermaid, that made me want to go into animation, specifically because I saw the animation from a specific artist. His name is Glenn Keane. Now, you've never heard of his name, no. but you know his characters, the characters he designed and animated. He designed and animated Ariel, The Little Mermaid. Yep. Uh, Aladdin, mm -hmm. Tarzan, mm -hmm. the beast, right? Like these are his characters. You've heard of them. And when I saw the little mermaid, I was like, wow, you know what? This medium of animation combines my two passions, my love of drawing, my love of film, put them together animation. So I worked to become a Disney animator. When I got rejected the second time, like I mentioned earlier, I went and saw a movie that inspired me to never give up. It was the movie Rudy. Did you ever see that movie? It's a football player, what you guys call it, football. Yeah, you call right? it football. Right. It's football with your feet, not with a hand. That's anyway. the one. And this is a true story. It's a soccer player or a football player. That's right. It's, a, it's football. American football. American football. Okay, right. That's American right. Football. So this is a true story about a guy. He's five feet tall. He doesn't have an ounce of athletic ability, and he wants to play football at the greatest university at the time, Notre Dame. It's a true story. And if you were friends with Rudy Rudiger and he told you his dream was to do that, you know what you would have told him as his friend? Dude, I love you. Get a new dream. But you know what Rudy said? Oh, yeah? Well, we'll just see about that. And he tries to get into Notre Dame, rejected. Tries a second time, rejected. Third time, 
rejected. But fourth time, you know, if you look at the movie poster for the movie Rudy, it says, when people tell you dreams don't come true, tell them about Rudy. He gets in. And tears were streaming down my face because I was thinking if an unathletic kid like that could get into Notre Dame with an insane amount of hard work, then what I thought was an untalented artist like me could get into Disney with an insane amount of hard work. And I vowed to never give up again. My dream was to be a Disney animator. His dream was to play football at Notre Dame. If I could go in a time machine back to myself at that age, you know what I would have told myself? Saul, grow up. You think your life's purpose is all that you get to work at Disney and draw? So you get to play football at Notre Dame. Big deal if you don't make it. People are dying out there. Grow up. Come up with a different goal. But when I say those words, having a dream to accomplish something that's only going to bring you pleasure, it matters because what you're telling other people by that experience is, if I could achieve my potential, you could achieve your potential. You see, in the beginning, all I wanted to do was sit at a desk and draw Mickey Mouse all day. I remember telling that to my sister on the phone. I said to her, if I could sit at Disney and draw the same picture of Mickey Mouse all day, I would be happy. But now, years later, I look back and I go, you know what? It's not that you're at Disney. It's what are the stories you're telling at Disney? What are the values that you're putting in your work? Through these movies, millions of kids out there are being educated. They're being taught something. They're being taught values. What are those values? I've, uh, I've had opportunities to work on projects that I, for kids that I thought were like not good. It didn't have the values that I wanted out there, not values that I wanted my kids to have. I look at it now as a responsibility, and I think that's something all of us need to do. We have to look at our passions and our abilities and say, how do I use my dream to be able to contribute to the world in a positive way? You know, I mentioned Glenn Keane to you. Mm -hmm this animator. I remember when I was in college and I was struggling with my own drawing and I found out that Glenn Keane used a certain kind of pencil. And I thought if I could use the pencil that Glenn Keane had, I would be able to draw like Glenn Keane. But this is before the internet. It wasn't so easy to find out what kind of pencil he used. But after research, I found out that he used some company, the Tomboy 50, whatever it was. So I tracked down this company and I called them and I said, hey, I'd like to buy some of these pencils. They go, you should have called yesterday. We're sold out. I'm like, well, when are you getting more? They're like, no, you don't understand. They're discontinued. We're never getting any more. I'm like, oh my gosh, I missed it by a day. They're like, but if you called yesterday, we would have given you some. We actually sold eight cases to one guy. I'm like, his name wasn't Glenn Keen, was it? They're like, how did you know? True story. So years later, I started Disney, four years later, three years later, and I get called into the office of Glenn Keen on the movie Pocahontas. He takes out a piece of paper. He starts drawing Pocahontas for me. He's teaching me how to draw her face with the angles and the cheekbones. And as he's drawing, I'm distracted. And he could tell I'm not really focused. He's like, what? And I'm like, is that the pencil? He's like, yeah, that's the pencil. And I go, can I hold it? He's like, oh, here. And I'm like, wow. And it has like teeth marks in it. I mean, this is the one that he used for Pocahontas, right? And I always think to myself, if people are doing something extraordinary, then the tools that they use to accomplish it become extraordinary. A paintbrush is a paintbrush, but Michelangelo's paintbrush, right? That's, that's a whole other level, right? And Glenn Keane said something to me profound. He says, Saul, it's, it's not the pencil that makes the animator. He told me that when he started at Disney, there was what was known as the nine old men. These were the, the nine animators that animated movies that we grew up with, our parents grew up with. Pinocchio from the 40s, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella. These were the, the guys that created this emotional animation, Snow White. And Glenn Keane told me when he was starting out as a young intern, these nine animators told him it was one thing that makes the animator. And they told him to write it down. He wrote two words down, put it on his desk, and he points to his desk at these two words. You know what makes the animator? Be sincere. You know what makes Glenn Keane's animation powerful when you're watching The Little Mermaid or The Beast or Aladdin? He said to me, if you don't feel it, the audience won't feel it. You know, we are in the business of trying to impact other people, trying to show them the light that they have within them. You know, you mentioned stories after story about people. And I said to you, you, you loved human beings. George Foreman loved human beings. It has to come from a real place. That's why when you were interviewing those people, you're like, I don't buy it. 
It's either real or it's not. You either love human beings or you don't. And if you feel it, they will feel it. You know, I always say more than people ever care how much you know, they want to know how much you care. I just came back um, yesterday from a 10-day trip to Israel. I do this once a year. I lead a trip of fathers, of dads. In order to go, you got to be a dad between the ages of 35 and 55. These are dads. Most of them have never been to Israel before, but it's a boot camp, a self-help trip to inspire men to want to become better fathers, better husbands, and better men. And my wife was asking me, how was the trip? And it's so emotional for me as a father leading this trip, because I lead this trip, because I see the potential in these guys, and I see the struggles that they have, or the same struggles I have. Don't, don't think just because I'm behind a microphone that I figured it all out. I'm mm. going through the same pain, the same struggles. And as soon as I accomplish a success in one struggle, believe me, if there's one thing life has proven, there will be another one tomorrow. You betcha. Right? And we, uh, in this kind of a platform, have to be vulnerable and open up about that pain and that struggle. And to see some of these dads hug me and break down in tears. And sometimes, you know, it's not about what I say to them. It's just hugging them, just, just sharing in their pain, like empathizing with them that they're struggling. And I say this to these dads. I'm like, you know what? I don't have it all figured out. I, I, I can tell you living a life of awesome, which is the name of my podcast. There's a shameless plug. Living a life of awesome means waking up knowing that I want to work through the struggle of life. Not that if I go through these tools, I will have abundance and I will have money and I will have success and I will be at the top of Mount Everest and I will have no pain and no struggle. There will always be pain and struggle. Living a life of awesome, living a life of meaning is being motivated that I'm going to grow through life. And hopefully that's the, the legacy that I'll leave my kids. What kind of a person did I become along the way? Did I become a person that lives a life of more humility, integrity? Did my word matter? You know, I don't know what kind of person Steve Jobs was, but I'm obsessed with this guy's life. And there's stories about him. I don't know what kind of father he was. I don't know if he was father of the year. Okay, he created great devices. But I can tell you this. If he put the same effort that he put into creating the iPhone into being a father and a husband... I feel like he would have left a, a very different legacy, mm. you know? Mm. Right? Tell me why you do the trips to Israel. What motivated you to do it? Um, years ago, I was speaking at a conference, and there was a woman that started this program for women. Uh, it's called Momentum. And uh, these women were going, and I think 20,000 women have gone already. And these women have been inspired to, to find their spirituality and to want to bring that into their home. And the concept behind this organization was, if you change your home, you change your community, and you change the world. And so a lot of these wives were going, and these mothers were going, but they're like, what about for our husbands? What's going to be for, for my husband? So this men's program was begun. A friend of mine, Charlie Harari, went on this program as a leader. He needed help. It was getting bigger. They, someone heard me speak somewhere on a the stage. They said, we'd love you to go lead a trip. And I was hesitant. At the beginning. I, I, I didn't jump at the chance. I didn't even know if I could do it. I didn't even know if I could do it. And I went on a trip, and I watched Charlie and after the first day, and I see these dads, and they're opening up, and I'm like, I have to do it. I have to do it. You got to get out of your comfort zone uh, in order to do something like that. And it's very difficult. It takes everything out of me. It takes all my, physically, it's very difficult. It's tiring, but uh -huh. all the emotion of it. But uh, I just got an email this morning from one of the wives, and she said, thank you so much. My husband came back. He was always a loving husband, but he came back a different person. He's looking at life through a different lens. Mm. And she thanked me. And my wife was like literally in tears this morning. Like, that's why my wife sacrificed letting her husband go for 10 days. So hopefully it could create an experience to nurture the potential in these guys. And as all these guys are thanking me, I thank them. Man, sitting here talking to you, <laughs> listening to your stories, you're inspiring me just being sat here with you right now. I can't, I can't thank you for taking the amount of time you have today to come and share your nuggets of wisdom. And also, you're just, you're just one hell of a guy. Thank you, man. Look, um, we all know that life is difficult, right? And, and for everyone listening, don't think ever 
for a second that if you accomplish whatever your goals are for the day, that your life will become less difficult. Look, money does make life easier. It doesn't make life more meaningful. It has the potential to, but it doesn't make it more meaningful. If there's one thing that humanity has in common is that we're all going to go through struggle. There's always going to be a test. You know, if you see a married couple and you think they look like that married couple, that's the perfect couple. The only reason they look like that is probably because they work at that relationship. You know, if, if you're raising teenagers and you think it's easy, you're probably doing a bad job. To wake up with the, the goal of life is going to be easy, that's, that's not a real perspective. Have the perspective that, yeah, my life is difficult. Jeff Bezos has a difficult life. By the way, I would like to have his challenges. <laughs> but Jeff Bezos has a difficult life. We all do. That's what it means to be a human being. But we should feel motivated that every day we can take small steps to grow as a human being. That's it. And each one of us should literally make a list of all of our negative character attributes. We all have them. How many of us could make a list if you're married? Believe me, you can make a list of how all the ways your spouse should change. True? If you have kids, what, you couldn't make a list of how your kids should be different? Yeah. If you work for an employer, you can make a list of how I wish my boss should treat me differently or how I would run the company better. The only person that we really can control in life is ourselves. So you want to take your energy? Stop making lists about other people. Make a list of yourself. Make a list of your negative character attributes. You know what life is about? Work on them every day, and there will always be another test. To me, that's what leads to a, a meaningful life. I, I appreciate you so much for having me. It's a pleasure meeting you in person. You know, I've seen your work online. It's incredible what you do and the impact you're making. It's an honor to sit with you. It really is. Thank, Thank you for you having so me. Thank you so much, man. I really yeah. appreciated your time. Thank you, Spence. Thank you.